Hi, can you hear me? Thank you. Hey. Yeah, so your camera's up front there. Okay. And you can see the camera. Okay. Okay. We're ready to go. Ready to rock. We're ready. All right. Let's do this. Okay. Good evening, everyone. I'm the library director, Leanne Wilson. Thank you all for joining us tonight for the official launch of a brand new book called The Choice Point by Joanna Glover and John Jonathan Rhodes. The Choice Point unveils a scientifically proven approach to overcoming mental barriers and achieving your goals. Joanna Grover is a board certified member of the International Coaching Federation and fellow of the Harvard Institute of Coaching. She's made significant contributions to the field of mental health with her work in functional imagery training. In fact, Joe was the first person to offer this type of training in the United States. As a cognitive therapist, and coach, she's worked with top leaders at the U.S. Department of Commerce, high-level executives at Citibank and IBM, and Olympic athletes. Joe has a BA in communications from Syracuse University and a master's in social work from NYU. Along with her co-author, Jonathan Rhodes, she's co-founder of Imagery Coaching. Joe's also a free porter, uh, as many of you may know. The Grover family. <laughs> Many of you may know the Grover family has been synonymous with Freeport for decades. In fact, it was Joe's mom, Rosemary, who coined the name Nautical Mile for Woodcleft Avenue in the 1960s. And her father, Al, is best known for his history making 3,000 mile journey from Canada to Portugal in a 26 foot Grover built skiff named the Spirit of Freeport. Joe is the founder of Operation Splash a volunteer-based organization dedicated to improving the quality of Long Island's South Shore Bays, waterways, and beaches. So let's welcome Joe back to Freeport. We'll get to you in a minute, Donna. <laughs> Co-worker Jonathan Rose is joining us virtually this evening. That is the technology team cooperating. Um, he's an applied psych uh, psychologist working with Olympic athletes, business executives, the military, in education, and healthcare. John holds a PhD in psychology from the University of Plymouth and is a chartered member of the British Psychological Society. As part of a series of projects with the aim to control intrusive thoughts, John helped develop functional imagery training and now coaches the approach specifically for increasing individual and team performance. By working on values, beliefs, thoughts, and actions, John credits lasting behavior changes to share connections, autonomy, and mastery, the fundamentals of intrinsic motivation. His clients report better self-awareness and increased self-efficacy and a higher level of resilience. This results in them planning effectively and achieving their goals. John lives in Plymouth with his wife, Katie, and son, Rory. Welcome, John. Um, after the, just a few notes, after the program, you have an opportunity to purchase a copy of the book, um, and the proceeds from tonight's book sales will be donated to the library. Refreshments for tonight's program were donated by Joanna's parents, Al and Rosemary Grover. We thank the Grovers very much for their generosity. <laughs> At this time, we're going to turn the mic over to our librarian and archivist, Regina Feeney, who will be moderating the conversation with the authors tonight. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Um, Jose, uh, Jonathan can't see us, is that okay? You can just hear us. Yeah, yeah, Jonathan, I'm sorry you can't see us, but uh, we want to take this opportunity to welcome you, welcome you to Long Island. Welcome. And for Joe, uh, welcome back to Freeport. We missed you. Oh, thank you. And I should mention that it's uh, 11... 11, 11, 10. 11, 10 p.m. Oh. <laughs> uh, I'm fairly not terrible, it's right. <laughs> all right. So, uh, first of all, congratulations you two on your book. It, it is it is great. And one of the things I really loved about your book is its combination of research, the scholarship, the the data, but also the storytelling. There's a, there's a lot in that. But on the data side, there's a couple of really interesting statistics that I I just want to point out that we have between 6,000 and 60,000 thoughts per day. 
And in a given day, we make something like 35,000 decisions, which means we're all very mentally tired. Um, so I'll, I'll turn this one over to you, Jonathan. Um, when when you are you have a goal, let's say you want to like lose weight or test better or perform better, what what is that choice point when it comes to decision making? Well, they're all fairly small. I think I think a lot of the tough choice points happen first thing in the morning as well. So if you can try and navigate those initial decisions, it sets your day up a lot more effectively than than not. And, uh, and, and for me, it's usually things like um, actually starting my choices the evening before, like going for a run, or the evening before, or the week before, kind of help thinking about healthy eating. So actually thinking more, more so about being conscientious of the choices that you'll make throughout your, you know, your, your, your future are really key, how you're setting up your, your key choice points. And we know that yeah, you don't have a great deal of choice points in a day, they become easier over time. Um, but yeah, you're right. You know, what, what we see at the minute is within, the, within the data is that you have roughly 6,000 uh, choices a day, decisions a day. So to eat healthy or not, to run or not, to exercise or not, to recycle or not, to you know, to, to, to take a certain route to walk or to, to work or not. So again, you make, you make many, many choices, but of those choices, there are some critical ones that are your choice points, which are very value-based choices. So to say more around health, maybe it's around communication and having that awkward conversation. So those are the real critical ones that we focus in on. So like maybe something about helping you make that choice point is maybe just putting your sneakers out so you know, okay, I'm, I am going to run. Getting yeah, your stuff ready. Right. And it could be this as simple as the first thing in the morning is wearing a gym kit just be, you know, setting things up the evening before we were about to you know, go, go, go for a run or maybe just be a breakfast meal that you're deciding on and you can, you can help yourself in the long run. So all those small choices will add up. So yeah, absolutely. The sneakers, yeah, if they buy your bed, something which is very cute central where you can you can see that the jolts your memory and it's very motivational as well. Okay, so this one's for you, Joe. So your book talks a lot about uh, functional imagery training um, to make your goals a reality. So can you talk about FIT and, and how does it work? Sure, um, and I love that you um, picked up on Regina that it's, we say it's both from the head, which is the data, that's John, and the heart, which is me. Um, and, and we um, sometimes get in each other's head and hearts writing this book, and um, it was quite a journey. But um, functional imagery training, I had read about it because I had a client who um, wanted me to do some corporate work around weight loss. So I looked up the most significant weight loss study and it was functional imagery training. And um, it went against it, like a lot of what I've been trained in. I've been trained to work with the way the mind thinks. Um, so rewriting negative scripts. Um, so you may say like, I'm always going to lose and you'd help someone rewrite that script to be more realistic. But this didn't work in the realm of words. It worked in the realm of senses. Um, and then we can really tap into, I think, that head and heart when we have that alignment. Mm -hmm. So um, instead of uh, thinking and overthinking, which I tend to do, um, I, it's imagining what it will be like. So I found it both for a client and for myself, but I was riding up in the elevator and um, some folks saw my scar on my arm and I joke and say it's, um, it's from a shark bite. But I, I was thrown from a horse and I shattered um, the humerus and the bone below. So my, own, my arm wasn't attached. Um, I mean, it was attached by skin, but not by bone. And I went through multiple surgeries and plates and screws and, and Im using imagery was the way that I was able to transcend pain. So this, it, it's really fascinating how thought will get you only so far. So like Einstein said, that logic will get you from A to B, but imagination will take you everywhere. And that's what we found in, John, in the, the it's, I always like to have the data because intuitively we know this, but like, can we measure it in science? And we can. 
Did I answer your question? You did. So, so there really is something to that mind-body connection, for sure. So like when somebody um, is training, let's say for a marathon, it's always about like getting your miles in. Like you gotta get your miles in, you gotta get your miles in. Because you're, it's that, it's, you're, it's the muscle memory that you're trying to build, right? And, but sometimes in the middle of the race, your mind goes sideways and you have what you refer to as mental movements. Right. Yeah, this is John's thing. He actually did a study on the ultra marathon. Is that what you're getting at? Yeah, so yeah. So tell us, tell us, Jonathan, like how, how do you get out of your own head when you're running a race? How like you hit that wall and it's your legs are fine. Your brain just is just melting. Yeah, I, I think I think we've got to start with uh, when, when I work with ultra runners, like professional runners who do this all the time, and in my head I think they must love it because they're going for five hour runs. Like who likes that? You know, even going for a five minute run can be challenging. And they say, actually, I don't really like running a great deal. Like, you're an elite athlete. Like, surely you must love running. Not really. Like, I'm, it's really hard work running up hills and over, you know, over various terrains. And, and they're just like us, right? Where, where, where we start something and we struggle. And we, we have those moments of, why the heck am I doing this? I could be doing so many other things than this. Um, and persevering is really a quality of, I suppose, you know, that, that, that the research is looking really at that. why do people stick with the things when their head says, um, no, stop, quit. There are other options. So again, people who do this generally they want to learn about how their mind's working and they want to try and master the chatter. And when you, you start to talk to yourself, you'll also start to generate images as well. So when you think, I'm going to stop, your brain will say, oh, yeah, well, if you stop, imagine how good it would feel. Imagine what you'll say to yourself. Imagine, and then you start to employ elaborate, thinking about this in detail. So how do you manage that mental mutiny? You manage it through, in a way, you can manage it through experience, through, you know, actually enjoying that experience of mental mutiny and saying, you know, I'm actually the master, I'm the, I'm the captain of, of, of what I'm doing and I'm going to stay, stay on course. And also for a lot of our guys, they have this conversation uh, in the morning or they have it the, the evening before, the conversation with themselves of, I know I'm going to have this thought, let's have it now while I'm not in agony, when I'm not fatigued, and I can come up with ways to try and solve these issues, solve this, this mental mutiny and, and also overcome these, 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 these obstacles. And also to think about how good it would feel to actually run, you know, run a distance. To These guys are running 100 miles generally, which is a uh, uh, which is a feat. So um, you, need, you need the mental stamina, but even um, writing a book, you need mental stamina. Or sending an email sometimes, you need know, mental stamina as well. So mental mutiny and navigating it using imagery is really important and a skill that you can refine. Yeah, and as Sean was saying, so we use imagery in advance of the event and then in the event. Like to give you an example, um, I I find that I have a better day if I go for a swim, like a cold water swim. But the idea of a cold water swim is like oh, that first like few steps and then the cold. But instead of focusing on that, I focus on how coffee tastes after my swim, like a warm cup of coffee, and I focus on the smell and how it'll feel in my hands and how how it, nothing tastes better than that. So it's what John was saying, it's what you elaborate on. So you can use it in the moment. I'm trying to talk myself out of a swim, but instead if I use a sensory experience of what I love about after a swim, it's gonna override that mental meaning. And, and how would that work with like for people who are, don't wanna be ultra marathoners or don't wanna take a cold water swim? They just wanna give up smoking or they wanna lose weight. How, how does, like how can that help yeah. them? No, I have a really good story about that. Do you mind, John, if I tell a strawberry story? Okay, please do, yeah. <laughs> um, what's funny is, is, before I tell the strawberry story, so my father, who's in the audience, my father and mother, um, my dad's family generations ago came on the Mayflower, and um, the Mayflower left in Plymouth, and that's where John is, in Plymouth. And um, it's a little town. They have really good gin, if anyone likes it. <laughs> uh, for anything, it would be good for Plymouth gin. But um, so I, I often think like I have a fourth brother, and it's John, because we sort of can sometimes 
get along like siblings in a good or bad way, but perhaps we're related. We haven't done the 23 and me. But um, back to the strawberry story. Um, so the first, when I came back from being trained in this method, the researchers said, we want you to take volunteers, don't charge them, and see if, um, you know, see if you're good at practicing this and record it, and we'll make sure that you're adhering to the model. So I asked some friends, like, anyone want to try? And my neighbor said, I want to give up smoking. And I had never tried to help someone give up smoking before. And um, you never know in our work, because our clients drive the bus. We are simply really good listeners, and we're very good at teaching. But we don't know where the bus is going, because they're driving. So where we wound up on this bus to give up smoking was a strawberry. And he had a childhood memory of a strawberry. There was a delicious memory. And the sense of eating a strawberry brought back great memories. And it was the taste, it was the smell. He could hold it in his hand. He could see a strawberry field. How does it relate to a cigarette? I was wondering this myself. But the taste of a strawberry after a cigarette, it tasted like ashes. It made him sick to his stomach. So whenever he wanted a cigarette, he imagined a strawberry. And because I was his neighbor, I would, when, I, when strawberries were on sale, I'd drop off strawberries at his door just to remind him. And I can say, and John's met him, it's um, four years now, and he has not had a strawberry. He's not, he's not a strawberry because of the strawberry. So we never know, like, his doctor could have told him you have to give up smoking or you're going to lose a lung. You know, we often, we're doing a lot of training in the medical world because we approach health in such a bad way. We judge people. We tell them why they need to stop doing something. We make them feel badly. I, I know people who don't go to the doctor because they don't want a lecture. Like, what kind of world is that, right? Whereas this program, what's so amazing is we don't know what's going to drive your behavior, but we're here to listen, and we're here to teach you a tool that you already have, but you just don't know how to use it yet. Okay, well, you know, that was something I was going to ask about, because um, when I worked in the corporate world, and some of you have probably seen these those motivational posters in business, and you walk in, and it's like teamwork, it's the guys in the, the crew boat, and there's like, I don't know, courage, and there's lions, and it's all about this visualization of, of like these, these things, things that you're supposed to do. Um, what I really loved about the choice point was it's, it's using all the senses and you, you know, bringing the smell and the taste. Because when I first read that, I was like, how is taste going to help you? But that's a perfect example of really, you know. Um, yeah, no, taste and smell, they're very compelling. The interesting thing is we, we think, and even we teach, and I know I want to give John a moment to talk, um, but we teach children like we all imagine the same, but the truth is we don't. Like, I don't visualize very well. When I read a book, I can't see the character's face when I'm reading it. And um, so John and the um, researchers at the University of Plymouth, they use something called a PSIQ. And that measures your imagery ability. In fact, John, do you want to give him some questions from the PSIQ? Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, Candy. Um, so we can measure imagery ability. Um, let's do it in the room. Let's, 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 give, it, let's give it a go. So, um, what I'd like you to try and do is um, rate this. Uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to give you like an object, for example. And in your mind's eye, in your head, um, if you can think of like how real this is on a scale of zero, what the zero is, what's John talking about? And uh, five out of five is it is as vivid and clear as a real thing. So if I say an apple, so just think about what you might rate that as. So just as like a show of hands in the room, just just a mini show of hands. Um, who scored uh, a zero? One. Two, three, four, five. Yes, yeah, so you can't see the room, but you have some good visualizers. Uh, yeah, we have a crazy house crazy. So let's do another one, please. So we'll do, um, that's obviously that's, that, that's visual. Um, can anyone taste if I say mustard? Mm -hmm. Taste mustard. 
and then Joe, you can look in the room. So zero, and then one, two, three, four, five. What's, what's the kind of average score, Joe? Uh, that that one was a little bit more spread out. Um, <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, we had some people in the middle, and then quite a few were high. Okay. My sister so, apparently cannot taste mustard. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, if you refer to mustard, you, you might either really get a kick of mustard when you say that, because it can make you feel sick as well, uh, or nothing. Um, okay, so we'll, we'll just do two more, we'll do one for a time. But um, we'll do um, can anyone hear hands clapping in applause? No way. Can you hear hands clapping and applause? Zero, one, two, three, four, five. A lot of people, a lot of people can hear applause. Okay. Okay. Last one, we'll do one more. Uh, and we'll do uh, the feeling of relief. Zero, one, two, three, four, five. Okay. So it's interesting for us because some people, when we do this task, um, will say, I, what? Relief? I can't imagine that. I, I, I experience it, I can't imagine it. Um, or visual, they'll say, I've got no image. And some people will have no internal chatter, which you might think is bonkers because you always talk to yourself. Like some people don't talk to themselves all the time. And if they, they think they might hear noises, they know not at all. Um, so again, everyone's imagination is very different. And why is this important? It's important because if you're working in a group and you're trying to convey a message to other people, and you're saying, okay, so what I want you to try and do is imagine our five-year plan, our KPIs. Some people are even say, yeah, okay, I get you, yeah, I understand. But they won't actually understand what we're talking about at all because they can't visually or they can't auditory or they can't actually see and imagine what we're talking about. So again, it's really important to measure imagery ability. And what we can do is we can then train it and we can work more so than your goals to immerse you in that goal-based experience. But Jonathan, how does that work with a team? Like, would everybody be then on that team be going through the same test? And then you know that these people are more auditory, these people are more visual? Yeah, so that, it's like we have here. So what, what we often see is, is when we do it in big groups, that there'll be a few people who, who don't rate them at all. They'll say, we, we can't rate um, uh, a visual for whatever. And we can, we can locate those individuals and say, well, let's work with you as individuals. But also, we, we can look at communication structures, how we actually are communicating based on uh, vision boarding, for example. Or you know, working with sports teams is a key one. Because the sports teams will often say, OK, so the next play is this. I want you to imagine the next play, and it's going to happen on all to go here. So actually, in a team, we need, to, we need to structure ways to communicate more effectively, whether it's using actually using visuals or getting people to feel the play by going out and doing certain things in a really practical <laughs> way. We we understand, we then communicate differently, and we can also teach people to increase their their, their injury ability as well. Very interesting. Um, I just want to talk, we, we talked a lot about data. I just want to talk to a little bit about storytelling. And in uh, chapter three of your book, you incorporate your dad's voyage um, across the Atlantic. And you talk about um, how um, your brother, Al Jr., I think they got to the Azores, and yeah, he, he's, like, here. he's here, he, he was like done. Um, and I just, I just want you to know, I have seen footage of that travel and I will tell you, within a half hour of being on that boat, I would have been calling the Coast Guard and been like, bring a helicopter. I'm off. <laughs> so, um, no, you made it to the Azores, like, you win. But this notion of goals, and, and you talk about how, like, if, if this was your dad's dream, but this, this that wasn't necessarily your, your brother's dream. And so, how important is it when you have a goal to, to make sure that, that you look at what other people like that this may impact like if somebody wants to let's say run for political office um like that impacts an entire family right so how important is that for success that you make sure that the key players stakeholders are all involved i thought this was only storytelling well you know, that was your story time but you know um okay 
Yeah. Tell us about it. All right. So um, yeah. So when we when we work with individuals or companies or athletes, um, that big picture perspective, that getting altitude on something, is so important because sometimes you're driven by a coach. You're driven to please others. Maybe you didn't really have a choice, so you're just pushed into something because you had a knack for it. And then you get to a certain point or a certain level and you start to have a mental mutiny. We've seen this more and more in the sports arena. Um, or even you get to the pinnacle of your career. Maybe you won Olympic gold or maybe you made it to the Olympics. And then after that, you have something called the Olympic blues and you're at risk for suicide. Like there's all sorts of ways that we can get really caught up in um, like putting, externalizing our value. So what, understanding your values and your dream and how it impacts others, that's something you do before you set out, hopefully. And we also talk about a walk away point. Like at what point are you gonna give up a dream because it's taken too much of a toll on you or your family? Um, and these conversations need to happen ideally in advance because otherwise we can throw up our arms in a moment of emotion and it's not really being driven by um, getting some perspective on something. So, yeah, and so in, in teams, so let's say, oh, I don't know, you, you work in a library that has a lot of departments and if you would ask everybody, you know, we have a mission. If you ask everybody in the library um, that works here, you know, somebody in reference like me would say, oh, we're about research. Somebody in children's room would say we're about kids. Somebody in, you know, some other department would say, oh, we're about books. Some people would say we're about, uh, you know, programming. What, like, how do you get everybody on the same page? Like, what, what, do you, what would you suggest that we do? Is it sitting down and making sure everybody understands the mission? Or, you know, how, how does that work? Um, well, I think, and this speaks to the third part of the book, and, and John actually, um, he was the only person from the University of Plymouth, from the, the functional imagery research, who went out and worked with teams. So he's really well equipped to answer this. Okay, yeah, so talk, talk, tell us about, he's still awake, John? <laughs> yeah, 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 I'm always learning. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, that, the important part initially is connecting. So you can do all the great work around values, you can do all the great work around a shared goal and a shared vision. Um, but if you've got a team that's not connected, uh, and, and I'm not talking about connected because you all, you know, you all have a pair together. I mean, connected based on deep connections, you, you, you know, you, um, you, you enjoy each other's, um, you know, uh, it could be company, it could be their conversation, it could be that you connected based on family things. Anything which, which is going to connect you is super, super key before you get going with a shared goal. So we, we, we found that a great, great depth in the military. You, know, you can do all the great training and look at all the history of legacy and where people have come from and what the regiment is. But it really comes down to, um, uh, you know, a band of brothers all connecting with each other, supporting each other and, and going the extra mile together because they all genuinely care. So I think that is really key, is that human connection piece um, drives the rest, drives the values, drives the goals, drives the hard work, drives the communication. And, and, that's the and I think fun, fun is part of that too, right, Tom? Like karaoke, yeah. fun is part of that, having fun together. Yeah, like yeah, karaoke, fun, yeah. the military does karaoke. My brother-in-law's here, he's a big karaoke superstar. But those sort of bonding experiences are really important. Yeah. Yeah, we, we, we often get the, uh, so, so these are all kind of elite courses guys, uh, um, and we get them to sing their karaoke song, uh, which we all have, right? We all have a karaoke song. Um, Joe, what's your karaoke song? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> these boots are made for walking. Nancy for Oh yeah, these boots are made for walking. I did it once. <laughs> <laughs> um, so everyone's got one, and what, what, we, what, we, what they do as a group is they, um, they share it, and then they ultimately, and again, this one didn't come out of the research, it came out of them um, being vulnerable, for feeling, uh, just, just having that space where they're vulnerable together, and they all sang their karaoke song. Some of them loved it, or some of them hated it, um, but, uh, but it, it exposed you know, that vulnerability to them, they connected, 
and uh, and yeah, uh, and that's really important as that connection. Made. I thought that was you just mentioned vulnerability. Um, that was one part of the book that I was reading about groups because we've all been through those those training exercises where you get together and you find what we have in common, right? And you talk about in the book about finding your vulnerabilities, and that was the one point of the book I was like, no, uh -uh. no, 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 because I felt that was like very for me. It was like I don't want people to know my vulnerabilities, but thinking about it. Like, so I have never done a presentation like this. I have never done an author's thing. You I never know. I, I, thank you. Um, no, but it was something that I was, I was really nervous about doing because it's like. No, I, neither of me, by the way. Oh, <laughs> yeah. oh good. So, so that one of the things for me was like, I, how do you write questions when you don't know what, the, what your answers are going to be? So it's kind of, you know, a little all over the place. So I was really nervous about it. And I would tell people, when I told a few people, I'm really nervous about this thing. I'm really nervous about it. And every time I told somebody I was nervous, it was like a little bit of that fear dissipated. Because it was, okay, you know, like, you know, it was, it, I don't know, like it made me feel better. <laughs> yeah, no, um, uh, in therapy, uh, the work I did before, you know, just sharing your vulnerability in a supportive crowd. And I do want to emphasize supportive because I, you know, there are moments growing up in Freeport, like, where at the time when I grew up, like, it wasn't safe to be who I was, right? Like, because I was gay and that was like, well, you know, the church is against you, or which I don't believe, but... Anyway, um, there are, like, there are, I'm not saying be vulnerable in a group where you don't feel safe. That is unhealthy, and we don't advocate that for anybody. Um, I used to run groups, as you know, at Miami Central and Booker T. Washington in Miami, and these are kids who, like, the state is always trying to shut down these schools because they are forgotten and they're underfunded, and it's horrible. And... I can't just walk in there and be like, hey, be vulnerable with me, you know, because they're like, who are you? You're a social worker. You're someone who brings the police. So, you know, vulnerability comes when you have trust. It took me years to gain trust. And so we, we a lot of times, you know, we can say, oh, great, I'm going to follow this recipe and then I'll get to. But you have to be patient because it really depends on who's in front of you, what their story is whether they want to trust you, whether they can be vulnerable, because that takes a relationship. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about sports, because you guys have worked with sports teams before. And what I found interesting is, like, well, I feel like there's a lot of superstition in sports. Like you hear about guys that won't change their socks, you know, they want to keep a winning streak. Or, or they'll, they'll just people do odd things, and one of the things, like you know, I always felt like when somebody bounces the ball so many times before they serve, or they fix their batting gloves before they, um, and you know, before they take a swing at the play. I thought that was all superstition, but in your book, you talk about this doing those kind of things as cues to sort of like, okay, get in that moment. You talk about you know maybe snapping your fingers or touching the side of a boat or you know, if you're a rower or, um, you know, maybe touching part of your kit or your hair. Um, can you talk about that? Like how, what, what those cues are and, and how that works? I'm, I'm giving this to John yes. because he loves to th say things like that are pretty funny in that accent, like get a cue. <laughs> so, um, and kit. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I think, I think um, everyone has one. So in, in, in elite sport, um, you won't see them that often. It'll be a tap of a finger, or it'll be um, the way that someone adjusts their hair, or something which means something. So a cue is it's very deliberate, pre-programmed uh, behavioural thing that you might do. Could be something you might say to yourself <laughs> that you recognise. You know, you're, you're not in the right frame of mind. And you'll say something which is more positively spun, which is a cue to activate your entry. So cues are really key. And, um, and like, like if you watch tennis, you'll see 101 things. Um, there, of course, may be some superstitions to that in terms of people doing certain things. There may be some random things in there as well. But what we're talking about here is, is the more deliberate things that people do, like a bouncing ball, like a spin of a racket, um, like a like a small 
uh, you know, wardrobe, wardrobe adjustment as well. You know, these things are all cues that mean something that make people feel a certain way and that makes them um, uh, think and imagine themselves as well. The key here is about, about being deliberate with your cue. Your cue must mean something to you and the cue must activate your imagination. Or really, what happens next? What am I in control? What can I do? Um, so, again, you probably have cues already. Like when you wake up in the morning, you probably have a cue of, but for me, it's coffee. I'm, I'm a coffee, and the smell will give me a cue in it. feel so way. And then I go through my day in my head. I activate my imagery. Um, in the military, they, those, those guys are huge at having a sip of water. That's the cue to think about you know, the next stage of their uh, exercise. So, everyone has something there. Everyone usually has, has a certain cue. But it's about being really deliberate and thinking, what can I control next? Yeah, and so I just want to make a distinction between triggers and cues. So you're in traffic, somebody cuts you off, and they gesture to you. Now you're triggered, right? You, you didn't plan this, and you maybe have, like some of the clients you've worked with, you're quick to anger. But you have a cue. Maybe it's a ring, and maybe your kids' names are on that ring, and you turn that ring, you know, or you touch it. And now you're, you're out of the weeds with, like, between... You know, as Victor Frankl said, who wrote Man's Search for Meaning, between stimulus and response, there is a space. Mm -hmm. And in that space is your freedom. So are you going to give the keys to your life to this other person? I mean, a lot of people in prison who are there because they made split-second decisions, not because they're bad people. But between being triggered in response and responding as a space, and a cue will help you transcend that immediate anger or whatever it is. So your cue is tied to a bigger goal, a big, bigger vision for your life, maybe being there at your child's graduation, whatever it is. But you get out of the weeds of your emotions and into a higher plane. Could you give an example of a cue of somebody who was like wanted to lose weight? Like an example of what a cue could be. Yeah, so one of my first clients, um, I um, was a physician. He ran the um, OBGYN department at, uh, at the hospital in Miami. And he had um, multiple times, he was, he was obese, and um, he had multiple times lost over 100 pounds, and he'd lose this weight, and then he'd like run a triathlon, or like do incredibly like hard things to his body. And then he'd start eating again. And then he'd start beating himself up psychologically again. And this was a boomerang effect that his, was his whole life. So when I met him, um, he was really beating himself up, and um, and his cue, I mean, he had a few of them, but he realized one of the problems was the um, the cafeteria at the hospital because he had unlimited eating there, and it was too hard for him. So um, his one of his cues was like the door to his office. He would remember, I'm gonna, I brought my lunch today. I'm not gonna, you know, he, he would be reminded of why he's a doctor and then he wanted to be a role model for his kids. And so it would trigger this other imagery. And he also used it, as John was saying, the night before, he would pack his lunch. And then we'd troubleshoot. We're like, okay, if you pack your lunch and eat at your desk, are there any downsides to that? Well, yeah, I'll be lonely. And that makes me want to eat. Okay, well, how can you, like, is there someone you might invite to have lunch with you? Is there someone you might call? So we're like, we're using imagery to solve these problems. But his cue was like zipping up his lunchbox, um, another cue was the door to his office, so these were all reminders. And he wound up losing the weight, and what, in one amazing moment, he called me, because he had been working toward, like, his imagery was he wanted to go walking. He wanted, to, he was planning a trip, and he wanted to be with his wife and kids and be able to walk without his legs swelling, without being in pain. And um, so he would imagine that. And then he called me when, from the airplane, and I was like, is everything okay? He said, for the first time in a very long time, I didn't need a seatbelt ex like, um, extender. It was, it was so, like, I think I'm overtired, John. But it was, like, emotional for him because he, it was so embarrassing for him to ask for this. You know, it was kind of humiliating. And it was just, like, a moment, you know. And, and here he had spent his whole life beating himself up about his weight. And we were able to connect back to that human connection in a moment of like, I'm on my way, you know? And he, so yeah, cues are super powerful for overriding 
the neural pathways of habit. Yeah, I was going to add to that, Joe, as well. Just um, you mentioned about stimulus response. Uh, where, where we sit with, with the choice point is between that gap. Stimulus, something happens, how do you respond? Well, that's your choice. This is where we were. And your imagination is, is, is in that gap as well. And you're, you know, what you're saying to yourself is in that gap as well. So we're looking at what you can do at that, within that gap. And how do you manage that, those thoughts? How do you make better choices? So again, you know, cues are one way. Um, and for some people, it could be a cue is the fridge door. As your hand goes on the fridge door, you need to say to yourself, Do I really want to eat this cheese? For me, it might be yes, actually. It could just be that, that, that moment of my hand on the fridge door. That's a cue. And I have, that's the simplest the response is up to me. Yeah, and the average decision is made in seconds. Two seconds. If we can add a little bit more time on that, three seconds, four seconds, and someone can use their imagery, they are are now in control. They're not on autopilot. Jonathan, how much does like social media get into like help like hurt us? Like does it sort of some you know impact those cues or just gets in the way? Or it lends it lends itself to more mental movement. As well, what a question. Yeah, I mean, I, mean uh, I wish I could do your social media on my phone, that's for sure. Um, and I probably have a lot more time on my hands to, to run more photos, for sure. Um, but I think, um, yeah, I think again, like, all these things are all choices. Like, um, if, if you can be really mindful of what's your best self, what you know, how much time do you want to spend on it, rather than, you know, for a lot of us, and again, me included as well, um, you find yourself immersed on certain things and all of a sudden you, 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 your time's gone. So really, you know, it's about setting plans in, in place to ensure that you're making the most of your time um, and feeling present with those around you. Because really um, I think that we, we often go on social media to connect with people beyond us. And what we need to do really impressive for me, you know, I'm always very a family person, you know, and, I, and, and feeling present with my family is really key. So connecting with what's in front of you is a lot more, um, you know, a lot more jo joyous than social media in any way. Although I love that we're, we're able to, 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 to zoom thousands of miles away, so that's always a nice um, In the introduction, which Martina Navratilova wrote, overwrote, um, she talks about how she had a, um, she was told by a reporter that she had a hard time closing matches. And you mentioned that it's before a time where people were actually, there was a lot of analytics and there was a lot of, um, you know, watching a lot of tape. Um, do you find with some of your, your your sports clients that the analytics is sort of getting in the way? You know, that it, there's too much data for them? Or is it helpful? You want to take that, Jonathan? Yeah, uh, there's always the issue of too much data. Um, uh, as a guy I was working with at uh, London Olympic Games who um, was, was paralyzed by data, too much data we could actually compete in his own style. So um, I think there's, 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 there's the, the importance of analyzing, there's the importance of analyzing opponents, but the importance of looking externally and looking at opponents, what they might do. And also there's the real importance, this is, this is the part that, for him, he missed that, really, in his Olympic cycle, but of what can you do, what can you control? How do you compete? How do you play? What's your style? You know, so I think, being able to connect with beyond you, like external, is really key. Analyze that, of course, and then bear that in mind, and then do what you do best. Be you. I think that's a really key takeaway. I think a lot of the guys that I work with at the minute, Joe as well, you know, we're working with a lot of athletes. Um, playing to your strengths is really key. Keep playing to your strengths. You know, and again, when you're, when you're competing, don't think too externally about what can I control, what can I do. What am I working on? Or, you know, in terms of like, it keeps me moving my feet in terms of, you know, that tennis players, moving your feet more, being more active around the certain parts of the court. Anything like that is about you and controlling your process. And that's really, really key to be able to think correctly in depression. And I think with Martina, what she was saying is she didn't know if it was true, but she focused on it. Right. right. Stuck and in then head. she said, not every game. But 
like she'd be in the middle of a game like, oh man, is that happening? I don't know. Is it? And then now you're out of the game because you're in your head. And she was saying it's a really frightening place to be when you, because you need to be in the body and you need to be reactive. So yeah, it it's, gets back to the whole theory that this is based on, which is elaboration, intrusion theory. What you elaborate on is basically what you will become. One, one of the themes that um, I found in your book is this theme of failure. And, you know, Joe, you had, you had an equestrian accident. Um, Jonathan, you dealt with a, a UK football team who had a losing streak. Uh, there was a diver who, in a competition, had a, a, a major accident. Um, and But failure, like your client that couldn't lose the weight, if, do you not see failure as an opportunity? Like, you failed, and you, know, you got really hurt, but it brought you to fit, and you ended up here. But do you guys see that failure as, as, as an opportunity? Like, you, you can't change if you've never been challenged. How do you, how do you feel about that? Oh, right. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, I, 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 uh, I think, I think in, in the, the way the stories are generally told, we try to give a, you know, that there, there was an issue, and then they overcame the issue, was the end point. And clearly, you know, there, there are fifty shades of failure, and there are fifty shades of success, you know, and that continuous progress. It's, it's all about, you know, really about how we're going to try and, you know, achieve a goal. But also, when, when people generally achieve goals, what Joe said earlier, like Olympians achieving goals. They go, okay, I've achieved that goal. What's next? Or so like, who am I? Who am I? For, for a lot of us, thinking about goal setting, we, we work towards our, our kind of our, um, our terminal goal, and then when we do get there, but what happens beyond that goal? And that's really key. I think that failure is, is, is a part of it, and of course, you know, I wish we could write more so about learning. Um, learning, progress, struggle. You know, I always say to Joe that struggle is a very sexy word um, because we don't talk about it enough, do we? we? We don't talk about our struggles. We don't go home and say, hey, honey, I had a great struggle last night. <laughs> um, we, we, we talk about success and failure, you know, and generally we only talk about our good stories. And actually, struggle means that you care. Struggle means that you are working hard on something that you want to try and achieve. And so, yeah, I think, I think fail, failure is, you know, is, is, is often a term of language, but Ultimately, yeah, we, we generally look at it as pro progress and struggle, and you know, and that's part of the journey. It creates a stronger ecosystem. So, speaking of challenges, what was it like to write this book, um, living three thousand miles away during a pandemic? And... <laughs> it was a struggle. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and were there arguments about you know word choices in your book? No, like the American version or the, the well, there is a British version. The British version. Oh, okay. So John got to put in that funny spell. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, we struggled a lot, um, and uh, but it was and and John really did help me understand like this is part of the process. We're very different writers. Um, we come from different backgrounds. Um, in terms of, you can be in the world of psychology, but my experience was different than John's. So we had a lot of struggle, but we worked through it. Yeah, and it, it was nice at time to like have somebody say, don't worry, we'll get through this. Okay. Yeah, yeah likewise. I, I think, um, you know, it wasn't just because you guys, you know, leave out reviews in certain words. No, I, think, I think it was really, you know, the, the, the way that, you know, my, my background's academic, Someone told us to me, can you please write, you know, 60 anecdotes? It's like, what? <laughs> uh, not really. So, you know, between us, we were able to put our heads together and, and come up with, um, yeah, with, with stories that fit the, the research. And the research kind of, actually, to, to be honest with you, I think that I'm a better researcher for, for it and with, with Joe's input. And actually, the stories that, you know, that she tells in the book. Um, you know, with, with, with the gravers there in the audience as well, you know, it's inspiring stories that you think, wow, you know, wow. And actually behind a lot of these stories is, is usually a, another strong person that's not on the challenge, whether it's, you know, jo Joe's mum or whoever it is in the background saying, hey, you committed to this. You know? So again, I think that having people around you to support you, you 
And it's the two things, isn't it? Challenge and support. If you are highly challenged, you need a high amount of support. And if you're not challenged at all, you need a high support. And I think we raised the support for this for this task. So yeah, it's a great channel. Yeah. Okay, so um, I just want to say this. I want you both to promise me that you guys will never consult with the Boston Red Sox. <laughs> okay, I promise? Please. Yeah. Okay, all right. Let's make sure. Let's make sure that never happens. Okay, so um, so just th th this last question from me uh, to, to you, Joe, is what is your imagery for Freeport? If you... How do you, how would you love to see for this? Because you, John, let's hear the question. <laughs> <laughs> I can't see it. He's never seen it. What's your imagery for Freeport? Uh, I'll lose a signal. Come see you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, um, so I think Freeport's always been, um, there was a period of time where, I, like when I went off to high school, I was a bit of a troubled kid. So my parents sent me to the other side of um, Long Island, the North Shore. And I was like, Everyone's really white here. Um, and it was just like a culture shock. And when I said I was from Freeport, they were like, ew. Um, and, uh, and I learned to say I'm from a town near Jones Beach. Like literally, they'd be like, where? I'm like, yeah, it's near the beach. It's, it's uh, very nautical. Um, so I think I didn't really embrace where I was from. And coming back here and doing this here, it's funny because John and I were offered to like, do this book launch from a yacht in the south of France. We were um, offered to do it in the Hamptons. And, um, and I felt really strongly, and John supported this, that we do it in Freeport because it's a homecoming. And I think Freeport has so many cool things going for it that it is diverse, that it's gone through struggle, that it's gone through floods, that it's gone through riots, that it's gone through so much. And it keeps reinventing itself. And that is how you get a stronger ecosystem. That's how you get a stronger community. As long as you can listen and not judge and be, you know, have a common image that you're working towards. But I think Freeport's an amazing place. My sister's in the audience and my brother and my parents. Like it was it was a great place to grow up. Like it it taught us so much about like life. It is, it's truly a great place. So yeah, thank you for thinking of us. Um, so I just want to open this up to the audience. If anybody has some questions, if you could just raise your hand and I will um, stand up with your questions. Anybody with a question? Very simply, uh, how did you meet? Okay, so the question is, how did you guys meet? Uh, John stalked me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I had done this training in England um, and John was not there, it was two of the other researchers, and um, and they kept talking about him, like he's really smart, he's funny, he's really busy, and um, and then he reached out to me and said, you know, I like your website, do you want to write a book? And at the time, I had just landed an account with KPMG, and I was like, okay, but would you be interested in working with some clients? Because we have to fund this book. Writing a book is like a financial undertaking. Because you you can't work as much. You have to leave time to write. And um, and John started working with this very important client at KPMG, and the results started coming in. So then we decided to do a company around it. And, and to date, we've trained like 50 people around the world in this. Um, we have interest from huge multinational companies, um, obviously athletes. And uh, so it seems we we have the right book at the right time. We were nominated for Malcolm Gladwell's Next Big Idea. That book is being translated into um, five languages. Um, we'll be in the Wall Street Journal this week. We were in Wall Street in the Financial Times. Uh, so it seems to transcend, you know, continents. And I think we all know that the future is really not in our phones, it's in our imagination. Any other questions? Anyone? Yes. Yeah, first of all, I would like to thank you very much for getting involved in this whole concept throughout your life, working together and presenting it through the book. I can't wait to buy it and read it and apply it. Uh, as an artist, I think I've used the, the concepts of 
positive imaging, not only through my own work, but with my students, uh, certain technique that I've been working with. Uh, but I, I'd also like to thank Regina. You did a fine job. Yeah. Really good. Amazing. And, <laughs> Is getting sold <laughs> yeah. at least one. Yeah, Regina, I do have a question. Yes, what's your question? Okay, as you were talking, it, um, especially after the news of the submarine craft uh, being lost in search of the Titanic with a tourist group, mm -hmm. I wonder how many of them might have said, maybe I shouldn't do this. <laughs> and might have talked themselves or felt themselves into taking the plunge, no pun intended. And so that brings me to the question, at what point does um, it become choice point and checkpoint, where the mind becomes a checkpoint? Should you try to divert what the mind is trying to tell you? Or is that part of the whole process where you, you listen to the mind, you listen to the heart and the impulses, and you try to figure out the balance. You get what I'm saying? Yeah, I hear you. I, I don't check, know. check point versus, uh, you know, yeah. well, choice point. It's important to remember that the majority of our thoughts are negative. Unless you're, like, my, my co-author is a super positive person. Sometimes it's super annoying. But um, he is an eternal optimist, so he's an outlier. But for most of us, our thoughts are negative. And um, as a friend of mine said, she said, what you've helped me learn is that my mind is not on my team. Right? So for a lot of us, our mind isn't on our team. But this journey begins with self-awareness because we don't have an answer for everyone's mind because everyone is unique. But if you do bend toward the negative, like most of us, then you're going to want to check your mind. Because you're going to see things in a negative light. You're going to elaborate on the negative. And as we tell stories in the book, whether you're training to be a Royal British Commando, the images that you keep in your mind are whether you're going to finish that course. If you're elaborating on quitting and pain, you're likely to give up. But if you keep something in your mind that you're going towards, because this is important to you, you're five times more likely to succeed. Now, I think what you're talking about is risk taking, yep. and that's always a conversation you have to have beforehand. Because there's something called social contagion. So if we hang out with people, we are going to become like them. We and it's in our subconscious, it's in our unconscious. So you need to check yourself and who you're hanging out with. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Um, is the book available on? Audio, you know, audible or some audio format. Is it yet? Yeah. Is it yet, John? I know they recorded. Yes, it is. Yeah, I think I did see. I did see an audio, uh, an audio version of it too. Are we getting for overdrive? Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Any, anyone? Anyone? Okay. Well, thank you guys for coming. Um, sorry. I know. I used to live in Bournemouth. I know. I know. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much, John, and thank you so much for coming. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, anyone who wants to purchase a copy of the book, the books will be available in the back. And will you be a, a yeah, I can sign them. And the great thing is, it all goes to the library. It's all going to go to the library. If you want to, if you want to buy a book um, using a credit card, you just need to go downstairs and purchase it. Um, and ask for a receipt. Uh, it's $28. And just come back with this receipt and we'll, we'll give you a buck. Uh, otherwise, we'll take cash. All right. So thank you all for coming.